Well, listen, today I want to share with you what God has put in my heart. And it's really centered around this idea of having simple or small faith. That God can do so much with what you and I think is small or insignificant. You know, this message was really, really originated from a conversation that I had with Pastor Tim a few weeks ago. He said, he gave me the okay to share this story, so I'll share it with you guys. I remember having this conversation where he said, hey, Lewis, uh, a couple weeks ago, I ordered two garage door openers and I was trying to program them. And while I was trying to program them, I was following all the instructions that the instructor manual had. I followed them word for word, but all I can think to myself while I was programming these controls, it's, it's never going to work. <laughs> it's just not going to work. Anybody ever been there? It's not going to work. He followed everything step by step, and all of a sudden, eh, the first garage door opener started to work. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we have moments in our lives where we experience the, the exact same thing. We think and we believe that just because we, we, maybe we follow the instructor's manual on how you and I should live our lives, but if we, if we follow it carefully and vigilantly, but even still, there are times when it's hard for us to believe, right? It's hard for us to believe that God said, that God will do what he said he would do. It's hard for us to believe that he could do it for us. Maybe it's difficult for us to believe that, that, that we are deserving of him to come through for us. You know, I just ever wonder if there are times in our faith journey that we think to ourselves, is this really going to work out? If this is you today, then I have great news for you. It doesn't take much. All it takes is small faith, simple faith, to see mountains move. If I were to put a title to this message, it would be this, what you call small. What you call small. And I want us to go to our anchor scripture for today, and it's found in Mark chapter 4. Now, we're going to be reading just a few verses from this chapter, but I want to give you a little bit of context before we read these verses. First of all, the gospel of Mark is intriguing because what it does is it, it, it expresses to us as readers that we shouldn't only just listen to what God says, but watch what he does. And so as we read through the gospel of Mark, we find that Jesus is in action. Jesus, all through the gospel of Mark, Jesus is performing miracles. But then we get to John chapter 4 and we get to see a glimpse into Jesus' teaching. And in Mark chapter 4, he begins to teach us in what we know, a common way that he often taught, which is known as parables. For those of you that don't know what parables are, parables are just simple metaphors and stories that reflect and let us know more about the nature of God, the character of God, and reveals to us secrets about the kingdom of God. And in Mark chapter 4, Jesus is speaking and he gives four parables in a row. Now, what I love about this is that every single one of those parables deserve their own six-week sermon series. Now, I don't have the time to unpack all of them today. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the fourth parable that's found in that chapter, Mark chapter 4, verse 30 through 32. This parable is known as the parable of the mustard seed. It says this, Jesus speaking. He said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable? In other words, what story shall we use for it? What Jesus is saying is this. How am I going, what am I going to use that when I think, when, I, when you think about faith, when you think about all about my kingdom, how can I convey, how can you capture what I'm getting ready to say? And he says this. The kingdom of God is like this, verse 31. It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Jesus in this, in this parable is saying this, my kingdom can only be established by faith. Yet if you want to know what that faith looks like, that faith looks like the mustard seed. It's as small or as simple as a mustard seed. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions that we have about faith. And today in my short time with you guys, I want to I want to be able to introduce to you what, really, what faith really is. But most importantly, I want to share this biblical principle that I want you to walk away with. And it's this. You can lead through your doubts with just simple faith. 
You can lead through your doubts with just simple faith. What you call small in the hands of God can have the biggest impact. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says. Now we, we don't know too much about the writer of Hebrews, but he uses such practical and powerful words to describe the word faith. He says this, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. Now I got to give you context for Hebrews because if you study the book of Hebrews, you know that the book of Hebrews is all about, it talks about the fulfillment of the shadow of the law. In other words, he's, it says that Jesus is the embodiment, that Jesus is all that we've been waiting for. That's what the author of Hebrews says. It's about the fulfillment of God's prophecies and his covenant that it has all come to pass in the person of Jesus. Now, one of the misconceptions that you and I, I believe, have about faith is this. So many people believe that faith is simply a vibe. That it is just, it is just a feeling. That it's about having positivity. That it's about having mind over matter. Only positive thoughts here, right? And listen to me, I am all about positive thinking. And I am all about talking right. But can I say this, that is not faith. Faith is not about a quality or a size. Faith, if you're not careful, can be reduced to what I'm going to call today having faith in faith. You know what having faith in faith is? It simply means this, that you say you have faith, but your faith is not attached to anything. You ask people, do you have faith? And they say, yes, of course I have faith. I believe that everything's going to get better. Well, that's good. But can I tell you this, there is no power in that. Because it is not the size of your faith that determines the outcome of your faith. It's the object of your faith that does. I'll say it again. It's not the size of your faith that determines the outcome of your faith. It is the object of your faith that does. For instance, if I had someone bring me a chair and that chair was broken and they brought it on stage and I were to sit on it, it doesn't matter how much faith I have, that chair doesn't have the ability to hold me up. In the same way, if I jump into a pool with a life jacket on, it doesn't matter how much faith I have in that life jacket. What matters is this, is the object that I am attaching my faith to, is it strong enough to hold me up? You know, I remember several years ago uh, in the church that I served at previously, uh, it was our pastor's birthday. And it was my responsibility, actually, our team decided that we were going to buy our pastor a, a state-of-the-art 65-inch TV for his office. Incredible. And it was right before, you know, when TVs just started coming out, so they're a little more pricey than what they were today. And my responsibility was they gave me the money. They said, I want you to go to the store, buy the TV, and I want you to find someone from the church to go ahead and mount it. And I remember going to the store and buying the TV and then calling one of our friends who was a manager at Home Depot because your boy is not a handyman. I just called the guy, right? I called this guy and I said, hey, man, is there any way that you can put up this TV? And this guy showed up. He had all the certifications. He had, every, he had, he had things in his tool belt I didn't even know existed. It's like, what? what is that? He goes on and we bought this nice swivel, you know, the TVs now, you know, where you can bring it out and kind of put it all over. It was a, an amazing swivel. And I remember him calling me and said, Pastor Lewis, it's done. When you get an opportunity, go, go stop by the office and check it out. I was so excited. I went to our pastor's house and I said, hey, let's go to the church real quick because he had no idea what was going on. So we drove to the church. We opened up his office door and there it was. Immaculate. This beautiful TV. Right? The wall had been painted. Now, for those of you that don't know, my pastor was one that was into details, right? He didn't want any of the cords showing. I mean, it was, it was just perfectly placed. I looked at it and I said, it looks incredible. I looked at my pastor and he, I could see the grin from side to side like, oh, yeah, this is a good gift. And I remember him moving the swivel just a little bit to position it just right where he can see it perfectly from his desk. He sat down on his desk and then he looked at me and we started talking. And I tell you this, about 10 seconds later, it was like an act of God. 
This 65-inch TV came crashing off the wall, fell on the floor, and shattered all over into pieces. I thought to myself, <laughs> I'm going to get fired. <laughs> Can you fire a volunteer pastor? I wasn't even getting paid, but I knew I was going to get fired. It's crazy. I thought it was God's judgment. I thought to myself, God, do I have any hidden sin in my life? Is it a sin of omission? Like, what's going on? It was just so frightening as this TV came crashing down. So I called our guy and I said, man, what's up? You're supposed to be the best in the business. And he said, what did you do? <laughs> what do you mean, what did you do? I did absolutely nothing. We just moved the swivel and it fell. So he came to the office and he looked at the TV and what did he discover? He discovered that when he opened up the wall, what he thought was that he had drilled the TV into the beams in, in the wall. But the wall in the office was not up to code. So there, so there was sheetrock that was three inches away from the wall. So what he thought was he had drilled this big TV to something that was sturdy or something that was strong. But instead, he drilled this TV into just sheetrock. And listen to me, for a little while, somebody say a little while. For a little while, it looked good. Come on. For a little while, it held. For a little while, it was positioned good. But the moment something touched that TV, the moment something adjusted into that TV, the moment something external came against the TV, the TV came crashing down. Why? Because the TV was not attached to something strong enough. It is not just enough for you and I to simply have faith. You have to make sure that your faith is drilled into the gospel. That your faith is drilled into the person of Jesus. Yeah. That when external things come against your life, although things may look good, listen to me, all, all weapons may form, but they will not prosper. Why? Because you're drilled into the person of Jesus. You're, you're drilled to something that is strong. Something that could hold your life together. It's not the size of your faith that determines the outcome of your faith. It is the object of your faith that does. And what I love about this is I love what Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 says about this. Speaking of Jesus, it says this. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. And what does it say? And in him. And in him. Can I tell you this? God is strong enough to hold your life together. Amen. Drill your faith into the person of Jesus. Love it. I love it. Now, if we go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is being sure of the things that we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. This doesn't mean that you're going to wake up tomorrow and find a million dollars in your bank account. That's not what it means. That's not reasonable. That doesn't make sense. What it does mean and what the author of Hebrews is saying is this, I can be sure in the person of Jesus. That I am certain that one day when I leave this earth, I will see him face to face. And I will hear all of, all of heaven say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Not because of what I have done, but because of what I have believed. And because of what he has done. Come on, can somebody give God praise this morning? Man. All it takes is small faith. And so the kingdom of God is established in faith like a mustard seed. Now, in the rest of the time that I have with you today, I want to be able to, you know, share with you two things that small faith does. But before I get there, I just want to take a moment to address the misconceptions that we have about this word doubt. Because by a show of hands, how many of you would agree that it is not always easy to believe? Oh, yeah. You're not the only one. You know, there are so many people that come to church in an effort to change their behavior. And I love that. I think that's great. The fact that we want to change our way of living. But I want to mention this. Any effort that's spent towards changing a behavior, effort that's meant towards changing a behavior, will most of the time end up failing you. 
You know why? Because if you really want to change a behavior, if you really want to get rid of a weed, you don't just clip the weed. You pull the weed out from where? From its roots. And the root of, uh, and the root of behavior is belief. What you believe directly influences how you behave. And there's so many things that you can do, as Pastor Tim mentioned in our last series, Holy, Holy, to cooperate with God. I encourage you to go back and listen to all those messages. It will really bless you. But if you really want to change a behavior, you have to change what you believe. And what I love about the Bible is this, it is that it works on the belief level. So what we're going to do today is I want to show you through scripture to see what it is that you believe about doubt so that you and I could have it in proper perspective. And the first thing I want to say about doubt is this, doubt is normal. Doubt is normal. I'm going to read a verse and I hope it encourages those who are constantly dealing with doubt. Listen to what Matthew chapter 28 verse 16 and 17 says. It says this, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, what did they do? They worshiped him, but what? <laughs> I love this. Because as I'm reading this verse, it proves to me that it is possible for you and I to follow God's instructions to go to the mountain he sends us to go to, to worship God and yet still doubt. Now I want to give you some context. Because the fact that this verse mentions that there were only 11 disciples, it signals to us that this was post-resurrection. In other words, at this point, Jesus had died and he had resurrected. And theologians say this, that by this time, there were 13 different times that Jesus appeared to people. He appeared to the women at the tomb. He appeared to two men who were on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to 10 of his disciples. He appeared to 500 of the brethren. He, he cooked for his disciples. He took the disciples fishing and then he took them up a mountain. I want to take a moment and pause to say that's why I love all types of vacations. Because Jesus was a beach guy and also a mountain guy. <laughs> I'm just saying. He did. He appears 13 different times to his disciples. And in Matthew 28, within the same chapter where it speaks about his resurrection, we find these two verses that many of us overlook. It says, the disciples worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Now what I love about this is this is before the ascension. Which means this, this is, be this is before Jesus had a glorified body. So just to paint, it, to paint a picture for you, you have 11 guys who are looking at a man with hole in his hands and hole in his side who's cooking for them. Who's preaching to them. And they were like, mm, I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's makeup. Maybe it's just been Photoshop. I don't know. Now, this gives me some encouragement as I read this because of the disciples who walked physically with Jesus, who saw the resurrected body, if they doubted, then it makes me feel better about the times that I do. Because sometimes I believe we think that if I just, if I were only more spiritual, if I only prayed more, if I only fasted more, then maybe I wouldn't wrestle with doubt. But the reality is this, we all wrestle with doubt. And it is a normal part of our faith journey. So I want to talk to you about why we doubt. I'll give you three quick reasons why I believe we doubt. The first reason why I believe we doubt is this. There are questions that you can't answer. You come across some questions maybe in the Bible. You say, I'm not quite sure that I quite understand. Or even to make it more practical for you, you ask yourself, why is this happening to me when I'm doing everything that I should be doing the right way? Questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? There are questions that you can't answer and that causes you to doubt. Secondly, we doubt because there are situations that seem unfair. You may be thinking, if I prayed about that and God didn't come through and he could have, then why didn't he? Does he not love me? And can I say this, by the way? He absolutely does. He loves you so profoundly that you can't even understand the vastness of his love. And he knows what's best for you. However, we doubt because there are questions that we can't answer. We doubt because there are situations that just seem unfair. 
And then we doubt thirdly, because there are hurts that we can't resolve. Hurts that we can't resolve. Maybe you looked up at someone and they were a believer and they let you down or they did something horrible. Maybe you went through a traumatic experience and you're thinking to yourself, am I ever going to get through this pain? Am I ever going to heal from this relationship? Am I ever going to heal from this divorce? From what was done to me? There are hurts that you can't resolve. And this is you and you have your doubts. I want to encourage you today by telling you this. Your doubts don't disqualify your faith. Your doubts don't disqualify your faith. God is not distant in your doubts. Your doubt, if handled properly, can actually be a catalyst for you to have stronger faith. But it begins with small faith. It begins with faith like a mustard seed. Now the second thing I want to share with you about doubt is this. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is. I'm going to read the story for you that I love. In Mark chapter 9, verse 17 and 18, it says this. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him into the ground and he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I love this. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Verse 21. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown them into the fire and in the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And I love Jesus' response. If I can. If I can. He said, everything is possible for the one who believes. And immediately the boy's father says, no, 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 no wait, 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 wait. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Now at this point, as I'm reading this passage, I'm going to myself, which one is it, bro? <laughs> right? Do you believe or do you not believe? Pick a side. That's what I would be asking for. But I think Jesus is okay with his response. This man, like the disciple Thomas, often get a bad rap because they didn't believe. But can I tell you this? Can I tell you how I know that this man believed but didn't fall into unbelief? I'll show you. Because even though he doubted, even though he was worried, even though he wasn't sure if Jesus could heal his son, you know what he didn't do? He didn't stay home with his son. Come on. He didn't stay home with his doubt. He took his doubt and he took his son to Jesus. You have to have faith in action, even if it's small faith. And I love what James chapter 2, verse 26 says. It says this, and we know it. Faith without works is what? Is dead. In other words, you, got that. you have to have faith in action. I ask myself this question. Do you know how much, how, how much work it would have been for you to take an invalid child before the age of wheelchairs, before the age of automobiles? Do you know what it would be like to carry an invalid child to wherever he had to carry him to get to Jesus. And he did it because he was at some level, he had some belief. And he put his faith in action. The man thought to himself, if I can only get my child to Jesus. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but he still went. You know what the difference between unbelief and doubt is? Is this, what you do with your doubt. Do you allow your doubt to keep you at home, for those watching online? Or do you allow or do you take your doubt? I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not shaming you guys. I'm just saying. There's valid reasons. But there are moments when we allow our doubt to keep us at home and we don't, get our, our, we don't take our child to Jesus. He said, I'm not sure, but he's still when, and then what I love about the story is this, he had every reason to doubt. The father had every reason to doubt. He had taken his son to the disciples and guess what happened? Nothing. In other words, what I love about this is this, maybe, and I want to encourage those who are in this room and those who are watching online, I want to let you know, maybe you tried church before and people disappointed you. 
Maybe you didn't receive the outcome that you thought you would receive and you expected. But I want to encourage you today, if you're watching online or you're in this room, I know you have your doubts, but bring your doubts to Jesus. Bring your doubts to Jesus. I'll say it this way. Bring your doubts to the one who can do something about it. He can heal your child. He can break those addictions. He can help restore your marriage or your broken relationships. I know you have your doubts, but don't let your doubts lead you to unbelief. All you need is small faith for God to do the miracle. Amen. That's it. Let me tell you this. There are two things that small faith does. I want to go over them really quick. The first thing is this. Small faith sees in the seed. I'll explain this in a second. Later on on that day, the disciples asked Jesus, why was it that we weren't able to do anything for this boy? And I love the account, that the account and the answer is found in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. This is Jesus' response. He says, because you have what? So little faith. Truly I tell you that if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I want you to notice this. When Jesus says little faith, he is not talking about the literal size. He is using an expression and he's making a comparison. In other words, he's telling his disciples, you have no faith. Because if you had faith that resembled a mustard seed, a small, almost invisible seed, then you can see the mountains move. What Jesus is saying is this. Even if your state of faith is practically non-existent, he can still use the small to do something great. A seemingly inconsequential speck of faith can move mountains. Now what you have to understand is this. Everything that God gives us, he gives it to us in a seed form. He gives us everything he gives us, he gives us to us in the form of a seed. Faith sees in the seed. Faith has the ability to look at the mustard seed, which is practically invisible, and say, there is something in this. I can't all the way see it. I know it looks like nothing right now, but I believe it can grow. I believe it can become. I believe that it's got potential inside of it. I want to ask you this. What do you see in the seed of your children? What do you see in the seed of your marriage, of your spouse? In the seed of your job, maybe in the seed of your dream, small faith looks at the seed and says, I can see power and potential that is packed inside of this. However, because God gives it to us in seed form, it is our responsibility then to plant it, to water it, and to grow it. And similar to a seed's growth, our faith can only grow when we believe even when we can't sense or see the miracle. Even when we can't see the seed grow, we, t we water it. We tend it, even when we can't see it grow. Faith sees in the seed. And then finally, faith works in the dirt. A seed's potential is only revealed once it's planted in the dirt. I want us to go back to our anchor scripture, Mark 4, 31 and 32. It says this, it is like a mustard seed that is what? Planted in the ground, although it's the smallest of all seeds, what happens? When it's planted, it comes up and becomes larger than the garden plants. So all he's saying is this. When I take this little thing, my seed, and I put it in the dirt, what seems to be insignificant, almost invisible, a one millimeter size and seed, horticulture says that it becomes, 30, it becomes a, a plant that is over 30 feet tall and 30 feet wide. Right? Why? Because it is, the key phrase is this, when it is planted. Can I say this? I just want to preach this for a second. Your gift is small, but when it's planted, it can make a difference. Your resources may be small right now, but yet when they are planted. Your dream may look small right now, but when it is planted in the person of Jesus, God can take what's small and make it great. Now stop, wait i got to finish with this. What does planted mean? It means this. It means that i got to take what I've got and I'm going to release it over to God. And I'm going to take what my little is and I'm going to say, God, I know you can take my little and make something big out of my seed. 
That which is small can become large once you release it. Now, I don't know if you've ever considered what does planted feel like or look like. You know, we say that word a lot in church, get planted in the church. And I think that's great. I think we should. That's the only way that you and I can flourish. But have you ever considered what being planted feels like? Can I tell you what it feels like? It feels like dirt. Yeah. In the same way that the seed has potential, the dirt has a purpose. You know, when I studied this message for this week, I thought to myself, I had this strange thought, what if the seed could speak? What would it say? Because I'd love to ask it some questions. I would ask the seed, how does it feel to be in a hole? How does it feel to be in the dark? Is it comfortable having all of that weight press down on you? Something tells me that the seed would say no. It's not enjoyable. It's dark down here. There's moments where I feel alone down here. Oftentimes, it feels like life is weighing down on me. And I have no idea when something's going to come up and spring up out of the ground. But I, as a seed, I have the confidence in this, that if I am a seed, I am not, I am not buried by this life. I am planted by this life. God has planted me in this life. And what I love about this is this. If I have a confidence in this, I know that I can let the dirt do the work and I'm going to grow. My thought to you is this, let the dirt do the work. What's the dirt in your life? The dirt can represent several things. It can represent the difficulties you experience. It can represent the pain that you're currently going through. The obstacles that you're having to face right now. It could represent the challenges or the weaknesses that you have. It could, it could represent your shortcomings or your failures. It could represent the weight of life that is pressing down on you. But in these dirt moments, I want you to know that they all have a purpose. Let the dirt do the work. And when it does its work, you will begin to grow. Amen. Your faith will grow. Your confidence will grow. So you and I must let the dirt do the work of teaching us, of refining us, and to helping us grow. You know, planting is about releasing what you have for God's glory. I want to say this to you with all my heart. Surrender to God what you've been going through and be ready for him to do the unimaginable. Today, surrender what it is. Surrender your dirt moments to God and watch what God will do. You know, some of you may feel buried by your doubts or your insecurities. You may feel hidden from God, like God doesn't even see you. But I will say this, you're not hidden, nor are you buried. You're just planted. And you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Remember this, bring your doubts to Jesus. Remember, it only takes small faith. Let the dirt do its work. And finally, remember, it's not the size of your faith that determines the outcome of your faith. It is the strength of your God and who you connected to. Did somebody get anything out of this message this morning? Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.